Magister Dixit. Magister Dixit. Magister Dixit. Magister Dixit. Welcome to Magister Dixit, a podcast that invites you on a journey into realms of expertise, imagination, and occultism. Delve deep into the minds of those that have dedicated their lives to mastering their crafts and how having an esoteric or supernatural influence has shaped that path. In each episode, we will engage with magisters, true masters of their respected fields, as they share their unparalleled insights unconventional knowledge, and their unique perspectives. Venture into the mystical as we converse with filmmakers, musicians, and renowned authors. Listen to their perspectives on their respected disciplines and how being a practitioner of occultism has influenced their craft. Remember, in the realm of knowledge, Magister Dixit, the master has spoken. In this episode, we're thrilled to welcome Lon Milo Duquette, a luminary in the world of occultism, esoteric knowledge, and Western mystery traditions. Lon's journey from being a successful musician to becoming an esteemed author, scholar, and occultist has captivated audiences worldwide. Lon is celebrated for his unique blend of scholarship and humor, evident in his 19 critically acclaimed books translated into 12 languages. His writings cover a wide range of topics, including tarot, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, and the works of Aleister Crowley. Lon's ability to make complex esoteric concepts accessible and entertaining has earned him a well-deserved reputation as one of the most respected and entertaining figures in the field. As a key figure in the Ordo Templi Orientis, Lon brings decades of experience and wisdom to the table. His insights into mystical traditions, coupled with his engaging personality, make him a sought-after lecturer, mentor, and expert in the realms of magic and spirituality. Let's welcome Lon to the show. Lon, I'd like to welcome you to Magister Dixit. It is certainly a, a huge pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. And, uh, I always like to ask our guests to maybe briefly share some early memories, uh, maybe a little bit about uh, growing up your childhood and maybe how that evolved into you becoming interested in music and the occult. Nothing I like better than talking about myself. Okay. Uh <laughs> Thank you for that for permission to do, to do that. Uh, well, yeah, I you know the whole part, uh, whole first half almost of uh, my book, uh, my life with the spirits. Okay, which is sort of I wanted to start off with like an autobiography. Uh, is about my. Uh, my early years, my childhood years, e even my infant years, uh, because that sort of got me going on the the mysticalness, or at least the the, the wonders of uh, an internal reality in an eternal internal life. Uh, I had a a bone disease. Uh, called Perthi, they called it Perthi's hip disease. It's a it's a bone disease that uh, at the time they had no uh, cure for or medication to take or anything else. Uh, if it's if it's struck in childhood, the only uh, uh, thing to do was to just immobilize the patient, uh, get them off their feet, you know. Uh, and just hope they outgrow it, you know, because I guess, you know, there's a good percentage of people that just outgrow it. So it was like a crapshoot. And they, of course, they thought it was polio because, uh, you know, I came down with it in like 1951, uh, which is right, polio, polio uh, season, you know. 
and all my neighbor kids had polio and things like that. so so in a way they were uh relieved that it was you know something uh besides polio but anyway uh I was really, really lucky to, to sort of be left alone in my crib uh, for hours and hours uh, on end. Okay, I couldn't get up. I couldn't uh, uh, walk around and play. And when when a kid starts walking around, uh, that's when they lose their pre-linguistic uh, uh, brain narrative if you don't have if you don't have words to uh to describe things to you uh you're still free to process images and impressions that uh, you had even before you were born does that make sense it, it, it does okay. I, I definitely think that there's a lot of symbology that we're born with that just even maybe part i mean how can how can certain symbols be part of you know generations and generations and so right, yeah. not really like get cooked into that dna you know yeah <laughs> so so i uh i could think about things like where was i before i was here without having uh, to uh uh be limited by actually expressing that in the words where was i before i was here and i and i had all sorts of uh, uh opportunities to to drift in and out of waking consciousness 24 hours a day so i i didn't sleep uh uh for eight hours and then you know up for you know the the rest of the time or take a nap here and there no, I was awake for 20 minutes and asleep for 20 minutes. In and out, kind of transient state. Yeah. Day and night. Okay. So there was little uh, uh, lines of demarcation between my waking consciousness and, and uh, dream consciousness. And whether or not that had any effect on why I'm crazy now, I have no idea. But I did toy with great profound subjects like what is existence and what what is who am I as a consciousness unit and where was I just a couple years ago <laughs> <laughs> you know? and I couldn't I couldn't picture myself being off Okay. And, and I started to, to, to wrestle with these uh, uh, issues. Where was I before I was here? And I could only come up with the realization that I've always been here, that there is no offness. <laughs> <laughs> Off, there ain't no offness. Okay. And that somehow or other, uh, you know, currently, I'm um, I'm operating from this platform, okay, but I'm not the platform, and uh, so that sort of got me off on a on a strange sort of uh, so you footing. Were very, you were a very deep thinker from the beginning. Well, yeah. It didn't seem like it was deep thinking. It seemed like, well, th th this is what I got to do, you know. And uh, and I didn't have uh, a great deal of uh, uh, trivial distraction. What was your family's background? Big family? Were you Catholic? Or I had one older brother, six six years older than I, mm -hmm. who was just a ecstatic that I was born because uh, it was uh, uh, I represented uh, a distraction from my mother's uh, motherhood learning curve. Okay, she did she did a better job with me than she had done with with uh, uh, with him, and and it sort of took the pressure off of uh, practice makes perfect. Uh, yeah, 
And uh, so, and all through our lives, uh, we had a, my brother and I had a very close uh, 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 spiritual bond. And years and years later, uh, when we took massive doses of LSD and watched the sun come up in the desert at Yucca Valley, uh, we, uh, I don't know if you're familiar kind of with what goes on, especially when you uh, uh, psychedelicize, you know, with somebody, but you stop talking. Uh, I have to say, I am very well. You stop that. talking so that, <laughs> so that the communication can begin, you know? <laughs> and and uh, we both just flat out uh, looked at each other and uh, came to the realization that we were our own great uncles who, who died. And we didn't know anything about these guys, okay? We didn't know anything except my, our dad mentioned it a million years ago as we were growing up that we had uh uh two uh great uncles uh and one of them was the uh, private secretary to hal roach the the filmmaker laurel the, and hardy the uh, yeah. little rascals and laurel yeah. and hardy and everything yeah and uh, oddly enough that was part of my crib visions was uh, myself getting into a, what I would later identify as the coolest little roadster and tooling down what I would later discover was the Pacific Coast Highway to meet a woman in Ensenada, Mexico. And, uh, well, that's a, that's a long story. We all have reincarnation stories. But anyway, and so... Uh, uh, it was my brother and I's interest in Eastern mysticism uh, in the mid-60s that uh, sort of got me formally on the on this kind of trajectory in life. Uh, I've already, always been in love with spiritual, inspirational spookiness. Yeah, that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, uh, my parents were Methodists. Okay, uh, my dad worked in the oil fields, uh, but as a as a driller, which is sort of like the captain of the ship, you know. And this is out in California. This is in California, and uh, uh, we moved to Nebraska when I was seven. But uh, it, it was a middle class post war. Uh, Leave it to Beaver, uh, <laughs> Oz, Ozzy and Harriet, Father Knows Best, 50s uh, uh, middle class uh, upbringing. And uh, my dad was a Freemason. He joined the Masons uh, the year I was born, 1948. And uh, because he was more or less an atheist okay but he couldn't actually technically be an atheist and be a mason too okay having to believe in that higher power or right so that was an easy way for uh, him to explain his uh 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 it wasn't skepticism it was just <laughs> just common sense, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but uh, my mother had been raised sort of uh, what we would call evangelical, uh, the Pentecostal uh, kind of hellfire damnation. I was going to say a little fire and brimstone in yeah. their uh, Sunday sermon. Right. And she had a childlike, she described it as a childlike belief kind of thing, which I always found absurd. But I found lots of stuff absurd with, you know, my mother. We all do. Uh, so I didn't take that as anything less absurd than every, anything else she was into. But uh, my grandparents, I always wondered, like, you know, they were uh, 
Irish immigrants and they acted weird. You had, when you called the house, you would have to let the phone ring a couple of times, you know, like three times and then hang up and call back with this like signal, you know? And I was like, I used to always ask my mother, like, why are they so secretive? Or whatever? <laughs> Well, we're now we're uh, we're the old people and have our our <laughs> eccentricities, but uh, they take us to uh, Methodist church. Now, the Methodists uh, uh, in those days, especially uh, uh, United Methodists, white bread, you know, regular Methodists, uh, were extremely socially conscious okay in the forefront of the civil rights movement uh, no hellfire preaching at all okay they love to sing you know <laughs> <laughs> and not get in trouble or to ruffle any feathers but there was this old church we went to that was uh, at belmont heights methodist church and i was taken there as a child and it was an old church, a Spanish style thing, and it smelled so holy. And it was dark and it was cool. And uh, there was, uh, you know, this neat kind of altar thing. And it just, it just felt like the house of God, you know. And I really, really dug that and i knew something was real in that not so much that building but in that thing in me okay and uh when we moved to nebraska uh to to keep me out of trouble i was walking after 14. okay i could walk without uh, uh crutches when i was 14. and uh so my we moved to Nebraska and, and my mother uh, insisted that I uh, enroll in the church choir, the children's choir. And I love to sing. And I found out that I could sing and I found out that being able to sing and be in a in a organized group of performers uh was the key to getting me out of having to do an honest day's work <laughs> and uh so you know i was a soloist and and things like that and uh so i'd be coming into the church for choir practice and then of course on sunday morning and then uh, I volunteered to come in on Saturdays and do uh, like folding the church bulletins and things like that. And then when I got old enough, uh, they sort of recruited me uh, into lighting the candles uh, ceremonially. There's a, there's a ritualistic opening and closing ceremony even with the methodists in those days so you're kind of like an altar boy or something. i was kind of like an altar boy yeah and uh, uh so i did that at the grown-up service so i came to the sunday school things saying early so i was at church a lot and the building there in columbus nebraska was a hundred years old in 1956 so it was an old old cowboy cowboy day uh yeah, nebraska in the 1850s yeah and it was the 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 year we moved 1956 was the centennial year so all the men wore beards <laughs> now can you imagine a seven-year-old kid from the coolest, hippest place on earth, Southern California in the early 60s, where, where uh, rock and roll was being invented, okay? And television had, had that burst on the scene and it was the center of the television universe. The magic of Hollywood out there. 
and then go moving to Nebraska, <laughs> which is already 50 years behind, but moving to Nebraska where all the men were wearing beards and the women were dressed like <laughs> like pioneer, like Mormons, you know. <laughs> and uh, culture shock. It was a culture shock. I'm still reeling. Uh, it, was almost like, it was like moving into an Amish community or something. Yeah. And so, but I took some kind of cool refuge in uh, in that uh, that spiritual world. But I was a hardcore atheist. I couldn't believe grownups believe this shit. You know. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. I don't know if I can say no, that. You're fine. Okay. So you uh, took very much after your dad. Yes. And not because of any uh, great conviction, but just freaking common sense. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't, be, can't be like that. Okay. Excuse me. They're flying up in the sky. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh, but still, I didn't mind. The, the trappings of it all, because I knew something, or I felt some, uh, uh, something was incredibly real there somewhere. A greatness larger than yourself, or some type of something there that you just knew that there was there. But uh, I'm lucky in so much that I, uh, from as long as I can remember, I've trusted myself as to, <laughs> to 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 what seems to be BS and and what what's what seems to be uh, uh, something wonderful, and um, so that's that. And uh, then in high school, uh, uh, the only reason that I got through high school is because. Uh, because I think I have attention deficit disorder, or they, they would diagnose why I was a class clown. Okay, they could diagnose why I had detention every night, every day after school. I had detention from sixth, seventh grade to twelfth grade. It was a school record. I was expelled twice in my senior year. And these were all for class clown type things. Yeah, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> the Vietnam War was going on, okay, in 1965, and uh, I uh, like Protestantism. I identified <laughs> the Vietnam War as complete bullshit. And I was not going to be uh, part of that. I was lucky enough to to have a very socially uh, uh, progressive uh, uh, teacher uh, who turned me on. I joined the the student peace union uh, and the students for democratic society while still in high school. And I uh, had a job where I could drive into Omaha and attend anti-war things, and and uh, so I was uh, I was socially conscious. And I uh, when the the Marines, I guess it was the Marines, uh, came to school and did a convocation. Uh, uh, to recruit uh, guys into the the service that weren't going to get uh, uh, to avoid being drafted. Okay, it was a scary, scary time. Uh, and I got uh, a bunch of literature and uh, went to a couple of training classes in in uh, Omaha. And I came back to school and I draft counseled in the school cafeteria <laughs> and i got expelled for get this sedition <laughs> okay now you 
I'm sure I was breaking some kind of uh, school rule, you know, by draft counseling on on campus. I could have got expelled for that, but no. <laughs> Sedition. Sedition. As as I didn't, if, know, I didn't know that schools had that law. <laughs> they don't. Okay, <laughs> they, they, they they were such rubes. They, they were they were just such rubes, <laughs> and. Uh, and of course, I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I had lots of friends in the uh, American Civil Liberties <laughs> un <laughs> Union, including the Episcopal priest in town. And, he, and when he saw the thing that they put it in writing, sedition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He wrote him a letter on ACLU letterhead, okay, and said, "This is the most embarrassing thing. I this is ridiculous. Ever, yeah, you should. I've ever, I've ever seen." <laughs> um, uh, and I got back, got back in, and there was egg on their face. But um, uh, it, it was, it was scary at the time. And this is the early '60s. This is 1965. Okay. Then I was expelled because I had long hair, but I I oiled it down in Greece. I was in a band, okay, I, and I'd been in a band since about oh, oh I don't know I, I, and it was a successful band. So it may have been a garage band, but it's a garage band that toured. You know, and what kind of music were you guys playing? Uh, it was a cover band. So we were playing uh, everything that was uh, um, uh, a year or so before the British invasion stuff, and then the British invasion stuff, and we called the panics. The panics. The panics, and we had a. I had a nineteen sixty blue Volkswagen van. Okay, and I I moved to California in that van, and I still have. Not that van; it got totaled by the band. Um, but I'm still driving a blue. And what, and what were we doing in the band? Were we singing, or were we playing? Oh, I was. Guitar? Yeah, I was uh, singing lead guitar. Okay, wow. So you guys were kind of like a pre-Beatles thing over here, kind of like. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it was still. Uh, uh, it wasn't heavy metal. Right. It was more heavy heavy metal. Uh, uh, that era actually comes kind of in line with so, so much of the other stuff that I want to talk to you about. It's 20 years ago today, Sergeant Pepper told the band to play, and that was actually the 20th anniversary of, uh, I believe, the passing of Aleister Crowley. 20 years ago today. Yeah, that's the, the, the date of the release of Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, I don't think that that reference was particularly referred to uh, Crowley, but uh, it, it's nice the way that it fits that he's on the cover and everything. And, yeah, they uh, did put his face on the cover. As a matter of fact, that's the first uh, time I saw just for Alex Crowley. Yeah. Took the words right out of my mouth, Babylon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, we were big Beatles fans. Uh, and we, uh my wife and i uh who you met in high school right met in high school yes and uh she, she so saw she, me so she stuck with you through all those uh expelling and uh, all the uh, sedition shenanigans in high school oh uh, yeah i don't think she thought very <laughs> much of that at, <laughs> at all uh as a matter of fact, I proposed to her on acid over the telephone. <laughs> I waited till our twentieth anniversary to tell her that. But uh, uh, we were hippies, okay? We we were hippies in the golden age of hippiedom, and we tuned in, turned on, and dropped out, and went to the wilds of Southern Oregon. Say, like the hate Ashbury days or the start the hate Ashbury that. days, but we, we sort of looked down on the on the city hippies. 
Okay, they, you know, we were out there trying to be self-sufficient, and and uh, of course that lasted about six months. And uh, California was such a rebellious place to be. I mean, whether it was the, you know, the like to me, just like you know, you have the whole Hollywood thing, but you had also the uh, image of all of these like uh, bikers in the fifties too. You know, right. Yeah town to town marlon brando you know and like you know the you know and mess messing around in california you know and like fighting with the cops and and then yeah. uh you the know pigs. yeah yeah and then how that just developed into the 60s movement and the 70s and everything and just like what a tumultuous ever-changing uh place to be living in those times you know certainly yeah. uh, you know well, just we a lot of we power were- we thought we were going to uh uh just before we moved to southern oregon uh we were uh into yoga and um uh timothy leary (laughs) (laughs) who later you know i uh we met and um but uh, the Eastern mysticism thing was uh, was a serious thing. We we wanted to be uh, 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 we were shooting to be a good Eastern mystic, and we moved to Southern Oregon because the uh, the person had a little bit of land that we wanted to buy and move on uh, was uh, uh, a, a psychic pranic healer guy. Uh, and uh, a follower of Yogananda, and we were Yogananda nuts too. Okay, still uh, we still love the Self Realization Fellowship uh, uh, movement, and uh, uh, so uh, we we built a little cabin for my brother and his his wife on the quarter acre that we bought by the Illinois River and and had run out of money. I sold my guitars and things like that. And uh, while I was in California, I teamed up with uh, another songwriter and uh, we uh, wrote a bunch of songs and uh, had a little duo kind of thing. We sounded great, actually. Uh, but then I we moved to Oregon, and uh, but all of a sudden, when we ran out of money, I just got the great idea that we should go down to Southern California, back down. It's only a two day drive kind of thing, and that I'd get a job in a saloon because I'd been playing in saloons in Southern California. And uh, uh, would make enough money to to build our second little house. So we went down to uh, that's what we did. We left everything there in in our little cabin in in Oregon. Drove down to Southern California. I walk into a the uh, a bar where I actually played. Uh, and uh, there's the bartender. I didn't even know who he was. And he said, hey, are you Lonnie? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to work tonight with Charlie? That's my old partner. I said, yeah. And he worked at uh, uh, a very fancy restaurant that's on a, on a steamboat, an old-fashioned steamboat in, in Balboa Harbor. And uh, we got together uh played for two weeks getting ready to come home the next day made the money okay two guys from epic records or for columbia records were getting drunk and celebrating their second gold uh record in 90 days uh the spiral staircase they produced the spiral staircase and they got so drunk that we sounded good and they asked they said we should uh, uh they'd set up a demo at CBS and instead of going home the next day 
we did the I we stayed another week so we could go to Hollywood to do the demo at CBS. Got signed. <laughs> got a record deal for two singles and an album. That's fantastic. Yes. Never went never went back to to Oregon. Well, that's almost like the California dream to get discovered in that in the in the bar or you know, or something yeah, like that, you know, and just totally life changing event. But that that got us out of the the official world of rural hippiedom. California and, pulled you back in. Yeah, that's exactly. They pulled you back in. Pulled me back in. <laughs> Just when I thought I was getting out. But I knew I couldn't actually uh, uh, make it work to be a decent uh, Eastern mystic because uh, it's hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, so I was looking around for uh, something in the in Western culture that had the same uh, the same thing because we in the West like to do things objectively outside of ourselves, even if the things that we're doing outside of ourselves are only representative of things that are going on inside ourselves. It's just our style. Mm -hmm. Westerners like to play with wands and cups and swords and and. Uh, uh, we like uh, to uh, exalt our imagination with with uh, conjurations and and uh, and poetry and music and and uh, the pageantry of, of colorful robes and and uh, bowls of fire and and celestial events and <laughs> yeah, so we we like that. As opposed to a Buddhist thing where you're just like more about your inner self. Yeah. Self, self, or is, uh, what is it? The sense of nothingness or not, not yeah. even selfness or whatever, you know? Well, the nothingness thing is what everybody's shooting for. But, uh, the, but the Eastern approach is to take everything away that isn't, isn't actually you just systematically strip it away it's a great way of, of going at it and uh, until there's nothing left to take away again and th there you are you if, when there's nothing left to take away you and god are the same thing <laughs> you, you, you hit this smooth point that's wall to wall and uh, but in the west Kabbalah is sort of the Western Zen. And in Kabbalah, you connect everything in the universe with everything else. You see that everything is the pattern of everything else. You see that everything is a reflection of everything else. And you connect everything until there's nothing left to connect, and you've hit that smooth spot wall-to-wall -wall spot too and i like that mm. okay i resonated to that and then that's what well, got so me who, who was the influential uh person that guided uh you to kind of delve deeper into the works and teachings of alistair crowley well, the first person that that uh, talked about Crowley that uh, didn't try to scare the shit out of me was Israel Regarde. And he was in California also, right? Didn't he? Have, yes. Was, was he, he was a psychotherapist a, or something? He, yeah, he's a Jungian or a Reikian therapist and a chiropractor, too. And... Uh, I had read his little book, uh, How to Make and Use Talismans. And then I read uh, The Eye in the Triangle. And I thought, gee, this guy s sounds sane. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like this guy, okay? And not only that, but uh, he made... Uh, while he understood what people were freaked out about Crowley, because he was Crowley's secretary in the 1920s in in uh, in Europe, traveled around 
uh, uh, Paris, and and he was he knew Crowley. Okay, he knew Crowley warts and all. And um, it, while he could understand that that people would be freaked, as they would be freaked at most any holy man uh, throughout all history throughout all time any iconoclastic figure is going to yeah. make everybody freak out i mean yeah <laughs> but at the same time uh uh was uh, uh totally respectful uh, and held in in awe of the spiritual dimensions of uh, of uh uh crowley's works and at the same time that well yeah he was a jerk and we had a falling out and things like that but it just seemed so real and uh so uh uh but even before regarding and before my interest in crowley at all i was interested in uh the kabbalah and tarot and it was the uh, my discovery of the Thoth Tarot deck at a B Dalton bookstore, or is called Pickwick Bookstore in those days, uh, of the tarot cards of the Thoth Tarot. And those and, are the ones done with late, Lady uh, Frida Harris. Yes, and uh, I had been taking the B O T A or Builders of the Aditum. Uh, uh, uh kabbalah course and and tarot course and uh so i was interested in in uh in tarot and uh rosicrucianism i had i had joined the rosicrucian order amorc uh also based because, in california right and um my brother joined first and said hey you'll like it it's like they're like magical uh, Freemasons, only they have women too. And I said, "Whoa, that's 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 encouraging." And uh, so the 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 back cover of the book or the, of the deck of cards was the Rose Cross, and I saw that. I said, "Ooh, I'm into Rose Cross stuff," and "Ooh, I'm into tarot." And I took the the cards home, and. Uh, they uh, they pretty much freaked me out. But I, eventually, after I stopped getting kind of freaked out, because they're... In what, you gotta, way, in what way were they freaking you out? They were too damn beautiful. The, the uh, art itself? Or? Yeah, the art itself is... Uh, uh, is or was just, the beauty in the, uh, the layouts and what it was revealing to you? Well, I hadn't gotten into the layouts too much, except that the the cards. I was, I was used to sort of a really, really toned down, white bread tarot of weight and bota, mm -hmm. and I I sensed that that this was on a level of art that perhaps was too much for my pedestrian brain and then it started to i i was reminded of the the great violinist uh, paganini who played the violin so awesomely that all the other violinists said the devil must be Nobody can play like that without the devil, you know, it's like Robert Johnson, you know, at the yeah, cross. You sold your soul for those. Yeah. Songs. Oh, God. And I said, these cards are so beautiful that it's almost like the devil made. And then I saw the name Aleister Crowley on the, on the side of the deck and, uh, or the box. And uh, I looked him up on a little occult dictionary that I bought at the grocery store of all places. Um, Is that when they used to have all sorts of neat stuff at the checkout? Like, yeah, know, like, you know, like you'd have all the horoscope books and like right. the moon charts and astral charts. And yeah. Make yes, your own, 
Yeah, make your own sushi and things like that. You know, the tabloid magazines, you know, with right. bat, bat Boy. And so this was one a cult a cult dictionary, and it said Alistair Crowley, famous Scottish Satanist. Okay. And from my point of view, my misunderstanding that there was no such thing as the Satanism that I would be afraid of. Uh, <laughs> I I gave the deck to my brother, uh, who uh, said he had the book, the Book of Thoth, Crowley's book. And he hadn't read the book, but he figured the cards and the book should go together. And then a, a friend of ours uh, came up from Guatemala, where he had been uh, mushroom farming. <laughs> and uh, I told him what I was up to and uh, that had been into Rosicrucianism and uh, tarot, and I like this magic kind of stuff. And, oh, but I got these devil cards, you know. And uh, he disabused me. He said, you're the stupidest you're an idiot okay you're an absolute idiot everything you everything you think you want to learn about all of this stuff this guy knows absolutely everything there is to know about it and if you going to study it anymore uh uh you're you're going to have to deal with this you know you, you need to get past like these uh um, yeah yeah uh, pre preset uh uh preconceived notions that you have about uh, Aleister Crowley and right it was like a little mini abyss crossing you know sure. you can't get over this you're not going to get <laughs> well and, there, and there's a very big wall yeah. that uh society's built up around him if you know just like for the layman somebody who's not aware at all just the uh yeah, you know, the average person these days what thinks of the Ozzy Osbourne song and <laughs> you know, maybe they watched uh, Stranger Angel. Yeah, Strange Angel, right? Yeah. So, but anyway, that's that's how that uh, the Thoth deck actually got me uh, uh, a couple years later in touch with uh, with uh, the McMurtrys, uh, Phyllis uh, McMurtry and Grady McMurtry. Uh, that's uh, Phyllis Seckler also. Phyllis Seckler, yeah. She was, she was married with uh, to Grady at the, at the time I met him. So the, I guess I'm. we've been corresponding since about 1972. And by, the, by 75, they finally knew that I probably wasn't a mass murderer. <laughs> and I finally figured out that they probably weren't mass murderers. And we got together and they... They initiated me in uh, their home in Dublin, California. Now, and Grady, he used to, uh, correct, am I correct? He used to visit Crowley when he was in the Army? Yes, he was the only American OTO member uh, that got to uh, uh, visit Crowley during the war years. He visited him a lot. Uh, uh, Grady wrote poetry and and Crowley really appreciated uh, that in a in a person. He was in the army <laughs> and could get petrol and a, a and a jeep from time to time. Crowley appreciated that and he uh, Grady was a fantastic chess player and Grady appreciated that. And uh, so Grady got to visit him quite a bit and Crowley had moved several times during the war and Grady got to visit him at all those uh <clears throat> all those locations and uh so uh, Grady was already a member of the OTO because there was an active, there was an active OTO group in Hollywood uh is that the Agape Lodge yes and that's where Jack Parsons Jack with, Parsons with, led uh, Wilford Talbot Ta Talbot Smith is his name. Yes, uh, that gentleman. Uh, I have the uh, the book on him. I had, haven't finished reading it. I've only gotten to the first few chapters. Uh, the Hidden God. Yes, yes. Yeah. But but uh, I I definitely have uh, 
I, I think I told you uh, off podcast, Mike, uh, I'm a total fanboy for all of this stuff. And I just get such an interest in going down the rabbit hole with like each of the characters that are involved in this whole amalgamated uh, thing, you know, <laughs> Western esotericism. Yeah, they're Jack Parsons and uh, uh, Forrest Ackerman, and and uh, uh, it, it was it was uh, uh, and Ray the, Bradbury, uh, the Golden yeah. Dawn years, even with uh, Bram Stoker and Yates, and yeah, you know, and uh, you know, you hear these so many stories associated with Crowley that most have been dispelled whether it was uh Yates kick trying to kick him down the stairs of the original uh, uh lodge or whatever and uh <laughs> well if you, if you can always keep in mind that the that all of these these luminaries at the time we're hearing stories about them they're like 25 28 years old <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're just kids. Yeah. Look what a jerk. Yeah, what yeah, what yeah. assholes we are at like 25 years old. You know, what wisdom do you have at 25 I can years believe old? That. Yeah. <laughs> so the or the magic wars, right? Didn't they have like a magical war? Um, oh yeah. Like see that Crowley? see that big poster in the back there? Yes, the revolt of the magician. Yeah, so the, the, that's uh, that'll never who knows whether that'll uh that's been a movie in production uh <laughs> for like now 25 years it'll who i've given up but there's a nice poster of it anyway so um, what's the and McMurtry, that, i'm sorry what, what's the mcmurtry's started to uh trust you <laughs> and likewise uh did you you join the oto and your wife did also yes uh she joined about six months after i did and um we caught up degree wise uh the oto uh you know it, it has a nine degree structure but it never ever uh actually functioned the way it was designed because uh there was never only uh, more than a handful of members okay uh there wasn't any of the governing bodies or, th or things like that the, the oto was more or less in crowley's mind was it uh was the oto originally a german uh yes concept yeah uh, is that where Carl germer comes in i uh, well yeah yeah uh and weren't they accusing uh Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, were they accusing Crowley of publishing some of the higher uh, levels, like telling the telling the secrets or whatever? And he was like, uh, "Like I don't know what you're talking about or whatever." And uh, oh yeah, it just happened to be. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a coincidence or whatever, but uh, he kind of they thought he was revealing all of this uh, you right. know, hid, hidden knowledge. And well, you then, know, and then I guess they were like, "Wow, he knows his stuff," and uh, <laughs> they decided to work together. Yeah, well, that's the that's uh, the the story, uh, and whether the story is partially fable or not, that's the mythology of it, and and uh, mythology is greater than than is truer than truth. Mm -hmm. And which sources do you deem? Uh, have veracity and which ones do not have veracity yeah well the th the thing was and uh and perhaps the story is told to illustrate a great point uh a true magical secret uh is only secret because you can't be a dumb shit and understand it. And, <laughs> or you can't be, you can't have reached a level of illumination 
enough to appreciate it. Or you haven't widened your brain enough to understand the full implications of it, even if it's breathtakingly simple. The idea, and uh, the story goes that, that Crowley was writing the book of lies. Uh, the, the marvelous book of just a series of one page chapters. And uh, he says that one of the chapters he wrote and rewrote and rewrote, and then he didn't like it, and he put it in, and he took it out, and he put it in, took it out. And then finally he said, I left it in just to show contempt for my readers. Now, <laughs> he, didn't like, really he, he loves to, it, yeah. it's like Crowley loves to keep you on your toes. He and, does, <laughs> right. So he said after the book was published, that he got a knock on the door from uh, 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 Theodore Royce. And uh, Theodore Royce was uh, a Wagnerian opera singer uh, who actually worked with Wagner at Bayreuth. He's, he sang in Parsifal. He didn't sing the lead role, but... Uh, and he was also... Uh, a member of the Prussian Secret Service. Yeah. Mm. And he was in London spying on Karl Marx's daughter or, or keeping she, track of her. Yeah. Was she going to like uh, Oxford or Cambridge or something like that? Or? You know, I, I don't know. But uh, uh, he was also a high degree Freemason. And a member of the the Hermetic Brotherhood of of Light, which uh, and all sorts of different uh, continental groups and subgroups and sub subgroups that studied uh, alchemy and uh, uh, astrology and it's all the the whole alchemical um, esoteric Hermetic thing because mm -hmm. high, high degree freemasons were into stuff like that in those days and they passed back and forth like like baseball trading cards uh charters and and uh, and uh warrants and stuff with you okay you can do these degrees and there's only about 15 people <laughs> trading things back and forth okay and they got great printers the certificates look Super. Yeah. And they're all Freemasons of some kind. Okay. Because uh, it's just kind of neat to have uh, the advantage of knowing somebody that can keep a secret. And you yourself are a Freemason, correct? Yeah. But I waited till I was 50 to join the Masons. I joined my dad's old lodge. So. I did also. Uh, I'm out here in Pennsylvania. I'm a master mason in the Blue Lodge, but uh, in Pitt, the closest the Scottish right one is in Pittsburgh, which is probably about an hour from here. So yeah, that would require. They got a, a great more. building. Oh, they do. The old. They got building. a great. Yes. Whoa, that's that's where. But anyway, <laughs> uh the OTO was one of these groups, and it was uh, that uh, Royce was the the head of, and they were interested in in like Persian uh, mysticism, Persian uh, uh, alchemy, that uh, was sort of the the pet project of their uh, leader, Carl uh, uh, Kellner. Now Richard Kaczynski has written a fabulous book about the hermetic uh, freemasons you got you got to read it cuz everything i say is just uh, anecdotal compared to real scholarship so uh i'm the biggest putz on the <laughs> i beg to differ i i i uh richard yourself uh tobias churton uh, yeah i always wonder like how they're able to how 
who and where and what do they get in touch with? I guess libraries that contain these letters and info uh, that's not published and they discover it, I guess. Is that how you guys do it? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Oh, there's a George Arendt's uh, collection and there's the Warburg, of course, the Warburg Institute. And, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're PhD. So it's like getting access to things that, nobody yeah. really has access to that that have been purchased by people that you know uh, right that tell little uh, that tell more of the that i guess you could feel tell more of an accurate portrayal of what happened yeah like and, uh, like for richard has that uh new book uh I, the about the friendship with uh, victor Ner, uh, nurberg yeah friendship in doubt yes uh, i'm looking yeah. forward to reading that too. like that i said be- you guys uh, are always kind of uh, what I can kind of consider, uh, you know, vet a lot of the Crowley speculation and give a, uh, the most accurate uh, opinion on them, you know, or the, the best uh, that we could come up with right now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Richard's Perdurabo is the best Crowley uh, biography, uh, hands down. Over the, Wait, uh, over Crowley, the, uh, John Siemens one or whatever. <laughs> well, the uh, <laughs> regarding was so pissed. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Crowley wrote that that book of lies and that one chapter, mm-hmm. and supposedly there was a knock on the door, and it was Theodore Royce. Now he knew Royce before. Okay, it wasn't that he came out of the blue and introduced himself, at least as far as I, my understanding is. As a matter of fact, when Crowley uh, had a lawsuit going with Mathers uh, uh, about who, who's a Rosicrucian and who isn't. <laughs> Again, these lawsuits are like the, almost like the, what you're talking about with the certificates. It's yeah. like these all these lawsuits that involve like five people or you know the same five people. But but uh, the the whole uh, European occult community split into two camps. One camp was kind of supported Mathers and wrote letters to the judge saying good, good things about Mathers, and there was those that didn't like Mathers and uh, they didn't uh, know Crowley enough to not like him. <laughs> <laughs> so they wrote letters in support of of Crowley and and uh, to bolster Crowley's reputation they all gave him honorary degrees. Okay. Uh really that like, like the co- like the college doctorate, right? Like, yeah, right. <laughs> and so uh, uh Crowley was already uh like a 7th degree member of the of the OTO. Okay. Yeah. But Nothing was happening with the OTO. Okay, there's, there's or very little was going, except the fact that they loved this idea of ecstatic alchemy, uh, and this is where the whole the the whole sex scandalish type thing. And oh, we got to keep it safe. No, it's just plain old Persian mysticism. Persian alchemy, okay, that deals with with huge ideas of consciousness, the idea of of levels of consciousness associated with the the ego busting uh, uh, techniques of ecstasy, and the, it it was no more salacious. <laughs> No more salacious than than anything, okay? But because part of it uh, dealt with, at least indirectly uh, dealt with, uh, uh, the act of physical lovemaking, okay, they had to keep everything really, really secret because, because nobody who has never even fallen in love can understand. <laughs> No European stiff collared uh, Victorian era are going to are going to get this. You yeah. know, none of them are roomy fans, <laughs> and uh, and so 
Crowley wrote this thing, published it, and didn't know even what it what it meant except the the level that he thought it meant. And Roy said, "You've you have printed our supreme secret." And Crowley said, "No, I haven't. It's like a Monty Python sketch. No, I haven't." <laughs> And he says, yes, you have. And and Royce went to the bookshelf, picked out the Book of Lies, and pointed to a chapter. And Crowley said, that's, that's your big secret of... And then it dawned on Crowley. My God, that is the big secret. <laughs> Holy cow. And so a light bulb went off on Crowley, uh, above Crowley's and then head. He go, of course I know the secret. <laughs> After he realized that they, that he like kind of lucked into. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, that's how the big secrets are. It's not the secret. It's not even the technicality of the thing. It's, are you ready to see everything in anything? Hmm. And Royce got him to that point, and Crowley got it. Okay, and and everything in uh, uh, Crowley saw in the OTO a way to with uh, dramatic Masonic type uh, rituals uh, and ritual experiences. Now you you know as a as a master Mason that you are a different person than you were before you were a master mason absolutely that that you were mutated by those three those three uh, entered past and raised you were mutated you're a different person well crowley thought the oto would be a perfect opportunity to use the scaffolding of perfectly good bona fide Masonic style uh, rituals to get people to that point mm. of where they see the everything in an anything. And, and that's what, when Crowley rewrote, because he didn't want to get in the way of Masonry, okay, he didn't want to, want to get in trouble with the Masons because uh, this isn't Masonry as we know it. So and that's what he, he, was, he was also a Mason too, wasn't he? Yes, yes. And uh, depending on on whose uh, uh, version of what's a bon of what's a traditional Mason and what's a clandestine Mason. Yeah. Uh, Did he? Uh, yeah, kind of like race through the degrees or whatever. It was a pretty uh, well, uh, process. Yeah. Oh, he uh, got his, uh, uh, he was raised in a Parisian lodge, which is, you know, pretty straightforward mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing. But his uh, uh, Scottish Rite, his Sir No Scottish Rite degrees uh, uh, were probably pretty raced through or and conferred, but so are the United States this the United States Scottish right experiences are pretty much uh, uh, just the landmark degrees and things like that. But uh, that's that's the 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 big secret. And when I look at the Book of Lies, I could see that Royce could have picked out any of those chapters mm. and said, this is the big secret and you've got to you've got to now join at the highest level royce went to crowley's apartment to recruit crowley into the highest levels <laughs> of the OTO just to get it off his hands i think you know it's like here, here's somebody who uh, i could just turn this over to yeah <laughs> Or, or, or a worthy star, or a worthy con contributor, uh, a worthy member of the group. And uh, I now, think he uh, certainly what was, it, uh, what was interesting when you were talking about how Crowley saw that scaffolding within Freemasonry, uh, 
you know, uh, to maybe lend that to the OTO also, you know, to have the levels in very much in the same type of correspondence. And uh, what I've always heard also is, of course, you know, we love to talk about Jack Parsons and his involvement with the OTO and with Crowley. And of course, that brings in L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, I've often heard and I, I've always become curious about how people, the opinion that Hubbard basically took the scaffolding of Thalema and used that to kind of structure what later became Scientology. And I just wondered uh, what your thoughts were kind of on that subject. Well, I don't, uh, aside from, uh, uh, just uh, the, the the basic uh, uh, lip service to in, in, in individual sovereignty mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, is part of the the Dianetics. Uh, what about like the fate and the levels and everything? And uh, people believe their correspondence with the OTO levels and. Well, uh, the, I don't see it. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, the I do know that that uh, Hubbard referred to his friend Alistair Crowley, and I don't think they ever communicated. Yeah, they had the only, no direct correspondence, right? No. Parsons uh, spoke. Parsons spoke about Hubbard in letters to Crowley, saying that he uh, oh my was God. a very very thelemic. Uh, individual yeah. and you know right. the most the limit individual yeah. and Carl, Carl Germer was also uh said in the letters to Crowley saying like you know uh Jack is like totally like you know cucked out to L. Ron Hubbard and being scammed yeah. by him and you know is taking his wife his so money I, I uh, uh uh Constance and I are friends or were friends they've all passed away now mm -hmm. of uh uh of uh, Helen Parsons Smith, who is who is the widow of both Jack Parsons and Wilford Smith. She's a dear friend of the family, and uh, that's awesome. That's so we funny. talked with 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 her a lot before she passed away, and uh, uh, Phyllis, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, and Grady, and they all are on the same page there's very little that they're on that these people were ever on the same page about anything mm -hmm. but they were all on the same page about jack had a real blind spot where it came to where it came to uh uh to hubbard and that that uh uh Crowley had written uh, one of them, and I, I can't say with certainty which one it was, that that Crowley wrote that he thought that Jack had fallen in with a confidence man or a con man. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I don't have the, I can't quote chapter and verse and, and who told us that i'm sure probably uh uh richard richard would would know what the source of that comment mm -hmm. was uh, but uh the i think it would be highly inaccurate to uh to try to link much of of uh the the doctrines of Scientology with those with those of Thelema in so much as uh, uh, the cultish uh, aspects of it are an uh, anathema. Yeah, I, I guess to, uh, to Thelema. Are you familiar with uh, gentleman John Atak? No. He's a, a former Scientologist, and he uh, he he uh, 
does some pretty uh, deep dive stuff on uh, the association of uh, Crowley with uh, L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, I guess he's a former Scientologist. Uh, he got out in, I think, uh, the 70s or something like that. But uh, he has some pretty interesting spins on all of that stuff. That I guess that's why uh, maybe some of those ideas rattle around in my head or whatever, you know, just uh, <laughs> always uh, curious about those topics. And uh, the, the other thing I would say is that, you know, you're so well at taking, you know, I mean, Crowley's magical system is, it, it's complicated. And, uh, you know, you're able to decode it and make and put it in a, I guess I would say, you know, in a palatable way uh, that beginners can become comfortable with getting familiar with Crowley's work. And was that your initial goal when you started writing books on the subjects? To bridge that gap? I, you, you know, know I, I've never had a goal in life. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just the opposite of what they told you to do as a kid. You know, make it. <laughs> I have no ambition. <laughs> uh, it's true. I'm the laziest person in the world, too. I mean, you have the. But, uh, you also have the. Uh, what is it? The uh, chicken soup Kabbalah. You know, again, another way of uh, yeah. introducing Kabbalah to people in a palatable uh, way that. You know. Well, it's it, it's it's all just a byproduct of. Uh, first of all, I write the books that I wish that I would have read in the first ten years of my of my study, uh, uh, with the hopes that I could knock maybe five or six years off of people's learning curve. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, take the wealth of your knowledge and experience and kind of. Uh you know, uh, exactly. Save people time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, when we were chartered lodge of OTO in 1978, <laughs> uh, I presumed it was my perceived duties as a lodge master to to have a weekly class okay. and uh but i was so young and so uh, uh new at everything myself that i was hard pressed to study enough to stay one week ahead of the class that i was teaching okay and over the years 40 some years of a weekly class and for three of those years it was two nights a week uh, you know i uh, have covered all the sort of the 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 main subjects the main techniques of uh, uh the various aspects of of uh magic and over the years, I've discovered that I can teach faster and the information goes in deeper if it uh, 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 occasionally is accompanied by laughter. Because, uh, face it, ev everything is one big cosmic joke anyway. Right. It's nice to have a little uh, levity in, in all yeah. of that, you know, not just be, you know. <laughs> so the the uh, Kabbalah is probably the driest and the, the most uh, uh, superficially unsexy <laughs> of of all these these aspects of the of the work. And. Uh, I found that I the, I could teach the Kabbalistic fundamentals uh, in a in a more lighthearted way because uh, face it it's it's it may seem complicated it 
in so much as uh, uh, it, it's easy to avoid seeing the simplicity of it. Uh, it's it's easier to describe the the creation of the of the of existence by by just holding up like a, a one of these things okay mm -hmm. showing the little little pipe cleaner little pipe cleaner things in the in the middle of it creating the the, the dimensions and make it fun okay <laughs> when i when i wrote uh the book that accompanies uh the tarot of ceremonial magic uh years ago 1990 something uh i had a, a book signing event at the bode tree bookstore in uh, west hollywood and uh it was a fun it was a fun e uh evening i had done a, a couple other book launches at the bode tree uh that's where what's her name uh uh did her movie out on a limb but anyway it's a famous shop and uh, i can't talk about the tarot without talking about the kabbalah and i was talking about kabbalah and i call it kabbalah and i don't call it <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, uh i was just uh, tossing around the the kabbalistic phrases uh, and words and nomenclature and stuff and i don't pronounce the words correctly there's i don't know there's four or five major dialects of of uh, hebrew and all of them say the the others are wrong and um and it doesn't matter for and that always makes for good uh interpretations right like uh, you know like you'll notice that uh and i and i've noticed that that we have new translations of you know documents now because the person who translated it sucked yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> they were a oh, horrible yeah. translator <laughs> yeah but anyway uh, when it deals with tarot it's all pretty straightforward simple you, you know you can mispronounce the words just fine just don't spell them wrong you know and uh but anyway there's this guy in the front uh front uh and he was in a black suit and a white uh, uh a white shirt with a button to the top with no collar you could tell the guy's a freaking kabbalist okay mm -hmm. this guy's an orthodox orthodox kabbalist and every time i'd say kether or bina or uh, Bria or bria the world of soft jesus Gibora, uh, <laughs> he would just go like this wincing <laughs> he would wince i'm physically twitch okay you could do no right <laughs> yeah and uh afterwards he charged the stage and i i was for a moment oh. physically uh intimidated and uh says what you teach is not kabbalah you don't even say kabbalah right it's kabbalah <laughs> yeah and uh you could tell that uh, and i understand and i respect <laughs> you know mm. uh where he's where he's coming from but this is tarot kabbalah it, it it's just one step better than masonic kabbalah okay <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it you know everybody's pronunciation is wrong you know um english kabbalah yeah and uh i wanted to say and and he's the one that said uh that what i teach isn't kabbalah it's and he's he's thinking of an adjective that's dirty enough to describe what kind of Kabbalah I teach. And he's the one that says it's chicken, chicken Kabbalah. And English wasn't his first language. And 
chicken might be an insult, you know, where where he's from. But then I thought, yeah, that's <laughs> what kind of yeah. Let's take and use that. Make yeah, it and then I thought, I thought. I wished I could tell him that my rabbi told me that there is no such thing as correct Hebrew pronunciation. And my rabbi said, says this or says that, because he, he was quoting his rabbi all the time, too. And uh, so that's when I decided to invent my own rabbi, write my own Kabbalah book as that rabbi, and uh call it chicken kabbalah <laughs> and and continue to make it in a way that uh, may not be uh kabbalah exactly but you know uh, <laughs> you're definitely conveying the concepts and 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 what what the person really needs to gather from that you know? and since since i've written that and and uh, son of chicken uh, kabbalah i've gotten i've gotten some pretty good response from the rabbinical community so well yeah. i mean you you are a celebrated author i mean you have what is it over 20 books now uh trans uh translated in over 12 languages around the world i, I mean uh you're a very accomplished author uh but one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about because I was a huge fan of it was the magical Egypt DVD series where you've got to be the host on the great work. And uh, I was such a big fan of, uh, what was it? John West, John Anthony West. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and his series and just how amazing it was. And uh, just how did, how did, did you get to meet, uh miss uh dr west oh yeah and uh can you talk about that experience that's uh, no, well yeah I, uh uh first of all we were on the the magical egypt series uh together but never met because okay. it's it's a all in it's a big project uh kind of thing uh but i was uh uh originally uh met chance garner and venice vavum she calls herself now uh and uh uh did did little kinds of kinds of uh uh things with them he's a talented uh uh animator and mm -hmm. and stuff and they're really smart magical people uh and so I, uh, they were asking me to make uh, little comments here and there, and and uh, uh, film little interviews uh, on one thing or another. Yeah, like little vignettes on certain topics. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's how it started. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, uh, they uh, produced a, a full. Uh, thing of my own called uh, Kabbalah for the rest of us. I don't know if you've seen that. But uh, uh, John Anthony West was the uh, was the anchor, the original anchor of the the Magical Egypt series, because he's a, you know, a, a serious uh, <coughs> Egyptologist that uh, was bold enough to put his uh, credibility on the line by pointing out the 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 true mystical aspects of of uh uh karnak i mean all, all, all everything yeah. all of that stuff the amazing power the, you know and the representations and everything i mean he make he made egypt come alive to me yeah. like watching the way he would explain things and you know he's not dismissive in like you know other people's uh maybe opinions on certain things but he likes to explain the, why he thinks the way things are according to you know what his research has been you know a and to me uh what's it uh 
Graham Hancock and uh, Rand, and Randall Carlson are very much in the true spirit of uh, John Anthony West in the way that in the way that they propose alternate possibilities of maybe what what's gone on on this planet, you know. Yeah. And, and I can't believe the uh, vehement resistance that they receive from the academic community right they're they're banned from sites they're, they're not allowed to go to you know uh, all these sites and stuff it's just uh I, I don't understand it and the more that you know you listen to them speak and it, it's it really jives with what john anthony west was saying about the water erosion around the sphinx and everything and yeah you know, and, th and this stuff's been here way longer than what we think you know the egyptians probably had no idea where the pyramids came from you know, <laughs> you, know yeah. they came, you know they came from the gods or something like that you know it's uh to, yeah to not think that maybe you know uh cataclysmic events here could have uh, maybe wiped out sophisticated societies or you know i mean alchemy always seems to be kind of chasing something of that too like almost like a uh you know a, an ancient technology you know where maybe that was something that they could do and turn elements into uh, other types of metals and things you know oh yeah there's there's uh uh it's so liberating even to speculate about things that's that have not ever been speculated on uh before the the idea of uh uh oh yeah also <laughs> the, the 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 new thing on uh uh, in physics is that uh uh you know they try to explain the the phenomena or the observable phenomena of the, the rate of expansion of the universe and the only way that they can they can uh uh, uh explain gravitational uh uh phenomena of, of of their measurements is that, that there's dark matter it must be so much <laughs> dark matter that all of a sudden somebody came up like day before yesterday and said uh, hey you know <laughs> and everybody's going wow i think he might be right that there is no dark matter it's just the light starts to fatigue <laughs> the the further it the further it drifts away from the source it, the light starts to yawn <laughs> you, yeah that that can do well that's how that's uh how the 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 idea that historic egypt that we've always been uh with, with a clock that only goes back so far mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and and other civilizations and 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 things that that could be under layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of of uh uh earth that is <laughs> that has, yeah, what what really would be around after a comet struck the earth you know and created you know the cataclysmic destruction that would occur you know <laughs> i mean you know uh could be, yeah. like you said be buried under so much other stuff and look at our civilization where uh i don't know we've gotten into a thing where we don't make anything beautiful anymore or to stand the test of time everything is made of glass and metal and, and uh, plastic what would really last after another that would all be gone you certainly i think uh, you know uh 
maybe 400,000 years after an event, you wouldn't find any of that metal or any of that glass or you know, yeah. any existence of us. What about all our stupid hard drives and our cloud and internet and our iPhones and everything? They would all be gone. Yeah. No. So, uh, uh, anyway, I'm really proud to be, uh, associated with the magical Egypt. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, you know, it, my, my wife has even done a, uh a thing or two uh uh with them uh they are a class act and one of the there need to be more class acts like uh, uh the magical egypt people and you also do uh some stuff with uh the gaia channel too don't you the what was it the gaia channel oh yeah uh uh george nuri and yes uh, yeah oh yeah i've been uh oh that george and i go way back uh you know from the the old art bell art bell show uh that uh was at the coast to coast or yeah coast to coast am and uh gee i've been on that show from time to time uh since my life of the spirits gee 1990 something you know so that's great and uh you i've been lucky and, and you're still a key figure in the oto and uh is did you did you how, how did you becoming uh a, how did you become the head of the oto was this a part i'm of not the, the head of the oto no no okay my my misunderstanding uh, i'm 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 the deputy grandmaster u.s deputy grandmaster so so you're a muckety of the uh... yeah i got a uh <laughs> degree, degree wise i'm uh i'm up there but uh administrative wise i just got a great title and this is all transcended down from the Grady McMurtry and Phyllis Seckler's yeah. Yeah. Uh, teachings and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, were they ever at the Agape Lodge? Oh, God. Yeah. They were. That's, that's where it all, <laughs> that's where it all, it was the only OTO operating. So they, in, they were some of the Bohemians hanging out at the Parsonage oh, yeah. and stuff. And uh, I know for a lot of people that, you know, saw the Ridley Scott uh series you know uh that stranger angel and uh is that the robert anton wilson book that that's based on or the sex and rockets or i'm sorry i think i have the wrong author i forget strange, sex, strange angel uh was a a pretty legitimate uh biography of uh of jack parsons uh, from a historical point of view, is a pretty pretty accurate. Strange Angel, the television series, was uh, uh, a good ninety percent fantasy. A lot of amalgamations uh, of characters, not really yeah, people and, in particular, and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, and enjoy it for the entertainment value, and uh, the the fact that it's good that people are talking about uh, the the historical characters. Well, yeah, I, uh, Jack Parsons is definitely really uh, that name has really come to the forefront in the last ten years or so. And he was such a cool looking guy too. He was, <laughs> he, he was so like many, a, right out of Central Casting. He's just a good looking guy. And I've seen so many shows that have like you know these uh, series where they've de dedicated an episode to Jack Parsons. Like uh, what was it? Uh, did you see uh, Lore? Uh, they had a series on Amazon. They have like two or three seasons, and it's a uh, lore about America. You know, uh, tale. You know, uh, tales of lore, American tales of lore. And they did one on Jack Parsons, and it was really good. It was a neat story. I it started from like his childhood, uh, you know, and kind of uh, dabbling with the occult to you know him blowing uh, his arms and legs off uh, in, in the backyard as they were getting ready to leave uh i believe to head to mexico or something like that yeah yeah he was moving a can of fulminative mercury it's it's odd that uh 
Uh, just prior to that, I don't know if it was on the uh, uh, with within hours of that accident that he blew himself up. Uh, uh, Howard Hughes picked him up in a car and drove him around uh, because Hughes was trying to get him to. Uh, my understanding is to to uh, uh, work for Hughes Aircraft or Hughes Engineering or something like that. And uh, uh, Jack uh, didn't want to work for Hughes. He got sued yeah. by Hughes too, didn't he? Herbert or uh, Howard Hughes sued him for, uh, I believe he brought home some plans or some paperwork on a project that they were collaborating on or something when that was- I'm like, not suggesting that Hughes m murdered him. Yes, yes. Or perhaps the uh, concept that the former chief of police who Parsons had helped put away uh, in the courtroom with the pipe bomb uh, thing, they also think that there could have been a retribution uh, killing there, too. Oh, L.A. in those uh, those days, if you've ever seen the movie L.A. Confidential, th that's a pretty yeah. accurate view of, of the LAPD. Mulholland Drive or whatever, uh -huh. you know, those kind of gumshoes, are, you know, they, they weren't far from roughing people up, throwing them out of windows. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very, very interesting tale. Uh, uh, Kenneth Anger, who just recently uh, passed away, the, the filmmaker. Yes. Uh, was a uh, very young man and he wanted to, Join the OTO, and I, I guess he went to uh, the Pasadena uh, home of Jack Parsons, which was also the at at the, that time the the Agape Lodge, mm -hmm. the Parsonage, over on Orange Grove in Pasadena, and he knocked on the door and uh, said he wanted to join, but. Uh, they they turned him away because he was so he was too young. Amazing. He, yeah. His but, book Hollywood Babylon's amazing. Yeah. And uh so uh, Kenneth was a was a, a friend of the family too. And was he? I, I, yeah. was, I, I was always uh, very enamored with uh his movies and uh just the way that like uh you know, he was a modern magician. He was, in, you oh, know, absolutely. reached out to everybody and just the things that he went to, even going to like Cephalus, Sicily and going back and like, you know, uh, filming all of that footage and stuff or uh, the documentary, the, the, the man we all want to hang. But again, in the in true Crowley it's a tongue-in-cheek reference you know it's about the gallery and you know yeah. and, you know and uh jimmy page uh lending from his collection and stuff it's just uh I, I i do find it all very interesting who all the players that are involved in all of that you know kenneth was staying at our house uh in costa mesa uh for a couple days mm -hmm. and uh uh, he said that there was a, a Valentino, uh, like a film festival, uh, at the Academy of, uh, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Academy Award people mm -hmm. in Hollywood. And it, uh, it, Kenneth didn't have a car, uh, and he said... Do you want to want to want to go to it? Want to drive me up to it? And I said, "Oh God, I get to go to the academy with Kenneth Anger." That's awesome, yeah. And uh, so, so we, we drive up to Hollywood, and uh, he says, "Oh, oh, I want to. Can we pick somebody up?" And I, uh, and I said, "Sure." And uh, so we get off on Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, the, the whole thing is just like right out of an Ed Wood movie, okay? <laughs> uh, it's right on Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, he said, pull over here. And uh, so he gets out 
and he comes back with an older guy uh dressed really nice kind of flamboyant and uh, uh they get in and it's forrest ackerman wow okay <laughs> Oh my God! How do you do? How do you do? He says, and uh, says, "Wow, I'm going to the academy with Forrest Ackerman and and Kenneth Edgar." It had to just be like it had to be so surreal. And then then Ackerman says, "Hey, let let's swing by and pick up Mikey and <laughs> or Michael. I think he called him Michael." <laughs> and. Uh, said okay and uh so we go around the uh corner over there sort of a hollywood and uh um uh, no i can't remember the the street it's sort of near where the scientology headquarters is that that basic area and uh, a beautiful apartment complex sort of art deco uh thing wait in the car for sacrament comes back with another old guy they get in the car and uh uh anger introduces us to, uh they said this is michael powell and all of a sudden michael uh, that I, okay how do you do you know and we get to the academy and uh we uh uh find seats uh three in a row because uh, they're they're going to have people speak and then they're going to play the son of the sheik it's so hollywood oh <laughs> like, and i'm thinking you know gee i'm my own great uncle here and the son of the sheik uh uh so many questions for forrest ackerman my god i just like i would how, how did you not like just drive him crazy all night and ask oh, like a yeah. million questions. Angora, you know. But uh, uh, I mean, he represented it, it, like everybody too, you know, back in the day, like Isaac Asmanoff and Ray. Oh God, yes, I uh, uh, Ray Bradbury, you know, and Ron um, Hubbard even. You know. So the uh, we get our seats, and then uh, the place is starting to get really packed. And it's old, old Hollywood people. I mean, a mummified, you know, contemporaries of, of Valentino and things. Wow. It's, it, it was like a, it was like some kind of a, a pocket of hell or or heaven, you know. Yeah. But uh, Michael Paul gets up and uh, has to go to the bathroom. So he gets up and goes, and there's that one seat right uh, right next to me. And uh, a woman comes in in like a fox stole that you haven't seen in 40, 50, 60 years. And she's aristocratic, okay, a uh, cinema queen of some kind and she says is anyone sitting there and kenneth anger says yes and she says this is it anybody and kenneth anger and this is where i find out who michael powell is he says only the director of the red shoes <laughs> One of the most famous Academy Award winning movie, The Red Shoes. It's it's the art movie par excellence. So there I am with Forrest Ackerman, Kenneth Anger, and the director of The Red Shoes watching Valentino. I know. Kenneth Anger is just such an enigma because of the the people that he knows, you know, or that he knew, you know, and I can't imagine, I mean, not that I would ever ask, but I can't imagine I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall and just listen to the conversations that, uh, you guys had with him. No, you know, I can only imagine, uh, 
you know, the stories that he could tell, you know, I mean, every, like I said, whether it's even the early tales of Hollywood, which let's face, there's a lot of magic in the early Hollywood and just the fact it's called Hollywood, you know, and the Holly, right? Magic Holly, you know, it's where we make magic, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and the fact that it was where the Agape Lodge was and that's where the Rosicrucian, you know, the AMORC is. And I mean, there's, and uh, there's just, uh, there's a lot of magic out there, both cinematically and uh, spiritually. Yeah, he wanted to uh, do a movie on the Gnostic Mass and call it the Gnostic Mass. And he saw us do... Uh, mass at uh, uh, a, literally an octagonal, beautiful octagonal uh, temple in Lake Elsinore. He saw us do mass there and he says, I want to shoot, I want to shoot it. I want to shoot uh, mass uh, here. And so uh, he asked if Constance and I would uh, uh, allow him to film us uh doing portions of the of the mass at that at that temple uh, so uh, i guess what chloe savingi or is that he had people lined up that wanted to do it including uh uh <laughs> well anyway i uh, he has he, lots of people really like kenneth anger and want to be in his films um uh, a lot of people liked Kenneth Anger like uh J. Paul Getty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so he actually came down with a like a two-man film crew and uh and we did uh, uh various sections of the mass so he could see how the uh but of course nothing ever came of that. But when he visited us uh to do that uh, at a friend's place that uh, had the property where the temple was. He brought uh, an uncut version of Lost Horizons, the the movie about Shangri La, and uh, with scenes that had never been uh, seen before. And he brought a projector wow. and. Uh, and uh, all up that side. yeah, and we watched it. Wow! He also brought uh, when uh, uh, Lucifer Rising uh, first was released. Uh, he visited us at uh, uh, and did little talk at our house in Costa Mesa for the for the lodge, and wow. uh, set up his projector. And we got to see Lucifer Rising the the week it was released. Oh my with, goodness! With Kenneth running the machine, <laughs> running the projector. That's that's the best. Could you get any better than that? No, you yeah. couldn't. You couldn't. And uh, do you know what happened with uh, him and Jimmy Page? The falling out during the Lucifer's uh, Rising. Uh, I don't know the, the, the details, uh, but they did have a falling out, I think. Oh yeah. They had, they had, first of all, if you've ever had to deal with on any level a, a bona fide genius, Uh, and a bona fide genius who's also an artist can be unpredictable, can be mercurial, can be short tempered, can be a pain in the ass, and can even at times be dangerous. Either one of those might describe either either anger or, or Jimmy. Okay. Right. 
I, I, I think you know you 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 really uh, hit the head on the nail with that. I think you know with with true greatness, I, you know, there's always a thin line maybe between that and insanity, great genius and insanity. Yeah. You know, and sometimes but they have a foot in each. You know, uh, some of our uh, greatest minds are also, you know, are also very, you know, tumultuous people. You know, yeah. angry. You know, uh, have tantrums and you know, short tempers. And, and when 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 you throw their art into it, their their art is foremost in their minds. The, the, their art is their God. Their art is more important than people's feelings. Their art is more important to their own safety. Yeah, their, um, yes, their, like Stanley their, Kubrick firing a gun off behind you without telling you to elicit that on camera. You know, yeah. or, uh, or making you do the shining scene, breaking the door like 60 times. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, that that could have happened, and uh, uh, whatever it was, whether uh, if you've heard the soundtrack mm -hmm. that Jake made uh, yes. uh, for him, it's good, uh, but it's it's uh, basically a lot of uh, noodling around. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's noodling around by Jimmy Page. It's it's, it's Page noodles. You know, it's great. It's wonderful. But uh, my understanding was it was not what uh, uh, Anger was looking for. Now I may have this this all wrong, and uh, uh, and I, I believe Anger uh, stayed uh, at. Uh, at Jimmy's, and Jimmy had a wonderful uh, film editing studio in his at his place, and uh, and you know familiarity can breed contempt. Yes, sometimes and and uh, uh, whatever it was, it, whether it's either mutually agreed that they wouldn't use the music uh, or not, uh, Kenneth kept the music and uh it eventually sort of got pirated well actually he sold it to uh, <laughs> uh yeah that's another story <laughs> uh, uh and then he had bobby bolsillier the manson fan. yeah <laughs> Family guy do it with his prison band, and it's pretty damn good, you know. <laughs> uh, and it was more, it was more uh, what Kenneth uh, probably had in mind, even so. Uh, anyway. Have you ever been uh, to Boleskin House? No. Yeah. Well, excuse me. Yes, I have. <laughs> I was thinking of Cheffaldo. I've never I was been to say, I, I was I think I saw maybe a clip where you were outside of the grounds. Maybe. I was I was out out. No, I jumped the fence. Uh, yeah, you went with your friends and yeah. jumped the fence. And did you get a, a wand or you got a stick that you made? Yeah, a wand or as a matter of fact, is it in there? There it is. Wow. So uh, it's a, it's hazel, okay, and I cut it myself, and our good friend uh, Brianna Siri's got it. Uh, Siri got it uh, uh, cleaned up to very nice. To this kind of thing, and it's 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 a bit you a bit long. <laughs> But uh, well, just another place with just so much uh, Crowley history that's been, yeah. you know. And uh, I don't think I'll, uh, I'm in any shape to ever jump over a fence again. <laughs> but I did, 
I think next time I visit, I won't have to jump over the fence because they're restoring it, you know? Yes. And I, I do follow that and, and it, they've made amazing, they've really built it from the ground up again. It's just, oh, it, it, it's not just fixed up, it's restored and it's going to, and it's a, uh, 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 environmental ref, uh, refuge, uh, Scottish government, um, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, uh, nature preserve. Yeah. I mean, it's good press for Boldeskin. It's good press for Thelema. It's good press for Alistair Crowley. And I hope nobody burns it down again. Yeah. And uh, I hope that it, I've seen some rare pictures of the ins of some of the inside uh, when jimmy page owned it you know with some of the old antique furniture in there and everything and i hope that it's uh something that we that we can all uh you know have the opportunity to go see and maybe see it in in that type of uh grandeur you know from yeah you know well it'd be it'd be nice to use it as uh you know a small conference center things like that for, for various, uh, uh, esoteric gatherings and things. And this beautiful country, the Inverness area is, uh, and the history even beyond Crowley with the, uh, Jacobites there and the, 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 uh, what, the people who owned the house even previously before, uh, Crowley. I mean, that's just all, there's a lot of history there. Yeah. You know, so it's definitely part of Scotland, you know? And uh, what, one other thing, lastly, I know I've had you here for a while, Lon, and I do appreciate it. Um, I want to talk about your acting role in uh, the uh, Puck Runyon uh, movie, The Lumerian. <laughs> well, which I do enjoy myself, but uh, when I did see it, I had no, I, when, when they, then it's a starring like uh, lawn and I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe like you're in here too. Cause I had no idea until I had seen it. It was a pretty small, pretty small part. And it was a lot of fun. Paul Clark played Jesus. <laughs> and uh, Mary Cammer actually did, probably did the, uh, did the best job. And, and uh, are, are you friends with poke Runyon? Oh yeah, God! Yeah, Oak, the yeah. the OTA and stuff, and yeah. uh, you know, Oak, I, I, what I always liked about uh, Poke Runyon was the availability in which he tried to make his system available to people. Yeah. You know, and I always enjoyed that. You know, and even the, you know, I'm old enough to have remembered, uh, you know, the. Uh, witches or the uh it was like the uh on uh tom snyder when he had all the occultist yeah. different uh witches on you know the the uh you know and the uh, poke was on there you know and it's yeah. like uh, yeah you know and uh, I, I think that's why i've always been interested in the occult because i was exposed to things like that my parents were hippies too we lived except for we lived in new york you know uh you know they were like woodstock type hippies you know and you know i as a young young kid i'd wake up you know and there'd be like you know 20 people sleeping on the floor and stuff like that you know from the night before you know <laughs> So it's very bohemian in that in yeah. that way, but they would let me. They I was exposed to things that I think, you know, I, I got in trouble in fourth grade. I wrote a book report on Helter Skelter, and my fourth grade teacher uh, wasn't too impressed with it, you know. And uh, did they expel you for sedition? No, we did. <laughs> we did not get expelled for sedition, but my mom did give him a. Uh, a, a piece of her uh, mind or whatever about judging about the book or whether you know it's like it was a bestseller. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you know it's what? like you know uh, it, 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 they. I always got to watch things like that. I guess you know, and whether it was like being allowed to watch The Omen or you know The Exorcist or things like that. You know, it's like. Uh, I don't know. I think that always like shaped my curiosity into things like this. And uh, uh, to have uh, an author like you explain a lot of it uh, 
in a way that resonates with me is also very important. I think that uh, that's something that you do very well. You, you know, like you said, uh, you said originally your goal was to write books to save people that, you know, maybe the, the, the that five years of research that you had done. Um, what about, do you ever see yourself writing books that are geared more towards a advanced uh, magician and the higher levels, things that really aren't uh, that palatable to the novice? Uh, I think they all are. <laughs> I guess what I mean is like, it always whole, seems like the whole thing about Monday night magic class. Yeah. Was that it was open to anybody who could behave themselves in our living room for two hours. And they didn't have to be in the OTO. They didn't have to, uh, they just had to behave themselves. Uh, and every week, there would be people who had only come to class a couple times, maybe only for the first time. There'd be people that brought friends that didn't, weren't hardly interested in this stuff at all. And then there'd be people that have studied this stuff for 35 years and write books of their own and and are lecturers and stars in the firmament of occultism. And every week, I tried to blow everybody's mind. Every week, I tried to give all of them something provocative, understandable, and mind-blowing. Didn't always happen, but that's what I was shooting for. And so, just because you can pick up, say, the Chicken Kabbalah, and and have a fun rollicking introduction to the kabbalah you can also pick up the chicken kabbalah after you've been a kabbalist for 50 or 60 years and find something that'll blow your mind too and so to answer your question i really mean that all of them are that they're fitting all for of them are all, as, at as, all different experience levels that they're so similar. that it's the only way i can write and and uh uh but first and foremost i write to blow my own mind and what can we expect from you in the near future what what what, what are you working on I'm working on something that I should be working on at this moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm right up at deadline. I'm, uh, deadlines. Oh, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a book. Uh, tentative uh, title is uh, 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 Building Your Own House of Cards. Uh, and it's, it's a tarot-based or the scaffolding is is tarot, uh, but uh, it's a full installation manual about, uh, in a sense, installing the uh, the the tarot within yourself, uh, and uh, understanding it, using it uh not so much as uh, uh cards that you pull out to read for people but uh cards that you, you that are so far in you you got to pull them out of pull them out of yourself to uh uh to work with it i i guess i'm not explaining it very well but it's uh it's a tarot based book 
and you have the opportunity to um uh, uh like the BOTA BOTA mm -hmm. cards that you color yourself mm -hmm. okay well let's see you uh the tarot of ceremonial magic th this is just kind of a uh there we go okay and then you can color them in yourself yeah as a matter of fact you're obliged to in order to understand what all that stuff is and i was very impressed by the uh, bota and the golden dawn's insistence that everybody make their own tarot deck even if it's funky and ugly and everything else that it you got also with all everything else too like the uh the ceremonial uh, dagger or whatever the air dagger yeah and, like and the cup and, and everything that that was all supposed to be very personal yeah and, and you make those objects you didn't just go to the store and buy them or, or whatever yeah yep uh, lon where can everybody go to uh support you know get, I, obviously on amazon all your books are available on there as well as like goodreads and you know uh but uh your website uh can you give us your website or what's the best place to you follow know I, you? I guess i got a website under my name but but it was mostly for my records um uh, uh the, the best way uh, to get me is is uh and to see what i'm doing every day because i do a show every day Seven I was going to bring that up on Facebook also. Yes. Yeah, on Facebook. So Facebook is my, is my blog is my, uh, I, I love the, I love parking lot magic. Oh, uh, <laughs> every you just call it the parking lot magic. I mean, it's, yeah, it's we'll the best. It tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you know, just, uh, I, I enjoy it so much. I feel like I'm, uh, in the car with you waiting, uh, for your wife to come back from, you know. <laughs> But the uh, uh, best way to to uh, to show support, uh, first of all, Amazon has everything: uh, the books, the music, the the everything. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, it really is helpful uh, for my publishers to know that my books are still uh, wanted. So the uh, I would pr prefer that you just buy my books, buy a six pack of them, and give them away to friends. Uh, and you can do that on Amazon. It's only pennies more if if uh, you buy it some other ways. But uh, and to give them great reviews too. Oh yes, yes, a lie if you have to. And, <laughs> And uh, my wife and I truly, truly uh, uh, depend upon uh, the generosity of our Patreon. I was uh, just going to ask if you had a Patreon account that yeah, everybody could go to also. Lon Milo Duquette on Patreon. And uh, uh, I, you know, I don't want to, you know, uh, beg but i tell you patreon uh uh at our age <laughs> uh, you don't make a great deal of money on occult books okay uh so our patreon support is very very important to us and and i would strongly suggest anybody that uh uh can uh be a patreon patriot patron to do it any uh are you going to be speaking anywhere any conferences coming up or anything or any speaking engagements yeah. that we can promote let's see uh what do i have going i guess i'm, I'm probably going to chicago to, to do a series of talks in june and uh in may i'm going to north carolina for something I've been staying pretty close to home since the since the pandemic, and uh, so I haven't been uh, out and about 
very, very is much. North, is the North Carolina one the, was it the Thelemacon or whatever? Is yeah, the, they do that, yeah, it, right? Or the Thelemacon people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, that I remember that getting all messed up during COVID. I had wanted to uh, attend that year. Uh, they had a, a lot of great speakers that were going to be there. I think Richard was also going to be speaking. There. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, next next year. Uh, there'll be uh, uh, Noticon, the OTO's Natural Convention, which will be celebrating my 50th year in the OTO. Wow. Amazing. Yep. If I make it. <laughs> that you will. Lon, thank you so much for coming on, Magister Dixit. I could... Uh, ask you a million questions so i'm gonna ask you to hopefully maybe come back on season two for uh a, another round with us <laughs> okay invite me back awesome uh take care and thank you very much have a good night you too